Good morning, everyone. I'm Roger Rowe. You may remember me from the Preacher Search Committee that began in the summer of 2017 and ended in May of 2018 with the introduction of Jonathan Stormont as our new preaching minister. During the process of searching for uh, the minister, I spent a lot of time talking to Jonathan, and I found that Jonathan was more aware of where we are as a culture and the church is in that culture than anybody I'd ever met. And here's one of the things that he taught me. In addressing our culture, he uses a metaphor of the seven years of plenty followed by the seven years of uh, famine from Genesis 41. He says that Christian churches in this country are very near the end of many years of plenty in terms of acceptance by culture and society. And he says that we're about to enter many years of famine in terms of that same acceptance. And I'd like to share with you a couple of experiences that have been uh, tremendous in my spiritual life that relate to what you just heard. The first dates back to 1999. That's when the elders hired Keith and Laura Lape to be missionaries to the inner city in North Little Rock. They went to the River City Church, and we went with them. Cindy, Laura, and John and I joined them over there for about six months out of every year. And our goal, or our job there, was to teach Bible class to the children. And we came to love our children. We came to love our brothers and sisters at River City. At River City, we found ourselves for the first time in my life in a spiritual war. The battles we fought in those housing projects were not fought with our traditional means that we had known in middle-class churches. The worship services at River City did not look or sound anything like the worship services at Pleasant Valley. Through means like the testimony and confession, relationships were built. And we saw God forge community of his people from those relationships. People who had nothing in common save Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. But after most of 10 years at River City, Cindy, Laura, John, and I were tired. And frankly, I was ready to become complacent again. And complacent I became. Until, as I mentioned, I was asked to serve on the Preacher Search Committee. And on that committee, we did a lot of listening. So here's where we are today. We're no longer competing with a church down the street who does worship differently than we do. We're at war. Our adversary is Satan. This war is being fought out on the ground on this earth and in the heavenly realms. It's a war for the souls of men and women and for the souls of boys and girls. It's a war for our own children. We're losing one out of every two of our own children between graduation from high school and early 20s. And in surveys of religion in this country, now the religious preference among most of the young is none rather than any religion. Jonathan's sermon today is about this cultural upheaval. It's the same upheaval we saw 20 years ago in the inner city. He saw it before he came here and now I hope and I pray that you see it as well. Today in this country, a profession of no faith is more common than a profession of faith. So what are we going to do? We can fight or we can do nothing. And by do nothing, I mean we continue to do the same things in the same ways that we've always done. And if we keep doing that through attrition, at best, we're going to become culturally irrelevant and irrelevant in our communities. And at worst, we may just die as a movement. Cindy and I are veterans of spiritual warfare. We've seen the consequences of doing nothing. And we've seen the blessings of saving a few. We're not afraid of fighting with all the means that are available to us, as the Apostle Paul said, to save a few. So we ask you to fight with us, and we hope you do, because this fight 
is for your children and your grandchildren and for ours. I'm Roger Rowe and I'm ready to climb the mountain. So for me, it all started about 22 years ago with this. Brother Foy baptized me at the Haskell Church of Christ. And ever since then, I've tried to follow Jesus as well as I could. My problem is I was baptized by a missionary. Then I went off to Harding and got taught to think like a missionary. But the church that I grew up in... Of all the churches I've ever been a part of, it's the one that formed me the most. And the worship there looked like this. We were racially diverse. Brian, a Down Syndrome member who was one of my best friends, would lead worship. And that church, while the production value was less than excellent, changed my life. Brother Foy was the first one who called me to be a preacher, and my mom wrote my first sermons. She's been trying to write every one ever since. <laughs> Through the years, I've had opportunities to leave Churches of Christ for different groups, but I've never been interested, and it's not because we're perfect. Y'all know it's not because we're perfect, because no group of Christians is perfect. We've got problems, but I like our problems. Through the years, as I've grown more ecumenical and gotten to fellowship with people from different denominations and stuff, I've uh, realized and appreciated the strengths they bring, but also every group of Christians has problems. And our problem, frankly, is that we uh, have very strong opinions on disputable matters on how we interpret the Bible. But one of the things I love about us is that we think knowing the Bible matters. And by the way, that's something this church does really well. The other day, last week, I was driving home with our kids, and Samuel was talking about something he learned in Bible class from Second Chronicles. This is not your average VBS stuff. No Jonah and the whale nonsense for us. Like, you're going to know Second Chronicles stories? I love our fellowship. I love the thickness of community that we have. I love Churches of Christ. And I've been told recently that sometimes when I preach, I come across like I'm trying to point out all the things that we do wrong. And if I come across that way, I'm sorry. I'm legitimately sorry. That's not my heart. I think you've got a point, though. My problem is this. When Brother Roger introduced me to y'all a year and a half ago, he told you that when I was interviewing here, I said it. If, I, if God was calling me to come back to central Arkansas, it would be the ministry of like Joseph preparing for the famine. And so to explain what it is we're talking about and to start off this short little series called Canoeing the Mountains, I want to start with the story. And by the way, if you didn't grow up in church, you're going to find this story fascinating. And if you grew up in church, you know this is one of the most interesting stories in the Bible. It starts in the first book of the Bible in Genesis, so turn to Genesis chapter 41. Now, if you're not familiar with Genesis, it's the story of the beginning of like human history, and it's actually filled with all these funny, raw, tragic stories, but the long the longest story in Genesis is the story of the, this young guy named Joseph. Joseph is the son of a guy named Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons, but Joseph is his favorite because Joseph is a little bit of a tattletale. Anytime his other 11 brothers are off doing something, Joseph runs and tells on them. So jo uh, um, Jacob, his dad, decides he's going to get Joseph a multicolored dream, uh, multicolored coat. Because those never go out of style, right? Joseph would later on go on to inspire a Broadway musical. And when the other brothers see Joseph dressing like Kanye West, they get jealous. Because their dad got their brother something special. And no sibling likes their brother being treated special. And it's so, they get so mad that they decide that they're going to kill their brother Joseph. And then they have a change of heart. They soften and they decide, we're not going to kill him. We're just going to sell him into slavery. So they sell him into slavery, and through a series of misfortunate events, he's falsely ac accused of a crime, 
and he's thrown into prison. And it's while in prison, he makes a couple of friends. He, he meets a baker and a cupbearer, both that used to work for the Pharaoh. And these guys, they form some kind of weird prison dream club. And they tell Joseph about these dreams that they've been having. And Joseph tells them, guys, I got good news and bad news. The good news is you're both getting out of prison. Your dreams mean you're both getting out of prison. The bad news is only one of you is getting out of your prison with your head still attached to your body. Body. It's the cupbearer. He's going to get out and he's going to return to service in the Pharaoh. And Joseph says to the cupbearer, when you get out of prison, would you remember me? Would you please remember me and tell the Pharaoh about me that I'm innocent? Would you let me go? And the cupbearer makes all these promises. And then when he gets out, he forgets. He forgets everything. And a couple of years later go by. And Joseph just is left in prison this guy who had all this, he had family and friends and all this potential. He just is stuck in prison until one night the Pharaoh himself has a dream. And it's this really strange dream about these seven fat cows that are um, eaten by seven thin cows. The Pharaoh wakes up in a sweat. Oh, thank goodness it's just a dream. He lays back down. And he has the same dream in a different way. It's, this time it's seven thick grains of stalk, or stalks of grain. And they're eaten, they're devoured by seven thin stalks of grain. And so that time the Pharaoh can't go back to sleep, so he calls all his magicians and sorcerers and people who can interpret dreams, and they don't know what to tell him, and they don't like not being able to make the Pharaoh happy, because remember what he did to his baker? And then that's when the cupbearer remembers, oh, I do remember one person who might be able to help. So they dust Joseph off, wash the prison smell off of him, and he comes in and tells them what the dream means. He says, God says to you, Pharaoh, you're going to have seven good years of crops. And then the entire world is going to go through a dramatic famine. If you got your Bibles in Genesis chapter 41, Here's what he says in verse 29. He says to Pharaoh, Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will not be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is because the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. Did you catch that? The famine will be so bad, the years of abundance will not be remembered. In other words, Pharaoh, you got a problem, and your problem is not going to be what you think it is. Your first problem is not the famine that's coming. Your first problem is going to be complacency. Because can you imagine being Pharaoh in this situation? For the next seven years, if Pharaoh does nothing, he would be the most popular guy in the world, right? Everybody's getting what they want. Their bellies are full. Their farms are flourishing. Groceries are cheap. And it's important to notice here, God doesn't tell Pharaoh the problem or the solution. He just tells him the problem. And he does it by asking Pharaoh to trust this guy who has almost no credibility, a Jewish prisoner who just got out of prison, the only credibility he's got is that he's done this one other time before. So why am I telling you this when we're talking about implementing worship teams and having an evangelistic culture? Well, I think for a lot of us, things seem to be going fine around here. And it seems like maybe we're just trying to mess up the good thing we got. And I get that. I've told so many of you, peop uh, so many of you 2019 was the best year of my life. And I've had a good life. I've loved getting to be here. I love preaching here. I love preaching for you. It fills me with joy, and I hope you know that. And it's because I love you and because I care about our fellowship that I'm trying to say these things. But if that ever gets missed, if, if ever I come across like I'm trying to say something that's got an edge to it or I'm being snarky, please come up and talk to me. Because I'm open to feedback, and there's ways I might be wrong, but it's because I love you, I'm wanting to tell you these things. In his great book, Canoeing the Mountains, the Presbyterian minister, Todd Bolsinger, 
starts off by mentioning, did you know that in 1963, the Los Angeles Times used to run every Sunday the scripture readings for the week? Can you imagine a world in which the L.A. Times ran the Scripture readings today? Can you imagine that? No, he says the reason you can't imagine that is because Christendom, the world that that happened in, is dead. You know, we used to not have to worry about evangelism. You know why? Because if you miss church on Sunday, your boss was going to come in your office on Monday and ask you where you were at church. Christendom is what, for the last few hundred years, has been going on in this country. It's why in Arkansas, right now, you still can't buy alcohol on Sundays. I was telling this to my brother, blue laws and things like that. I was telling this to my brother, and he said, Did you know that in Benton, a couple of decades ago, all the stores by law were closed on Wednesday nights? Because that's where the real Christians are in Saline County. <laughs> right? Can you imagine that today? It, it, Christendom is the world in which putting under God and the Pledge of Allegiance happened or reciting the Ten Commandments in school happened, but that's not happening anymore because post-Christianity, the same thing that happened many decades ago in England, has been going all across this country. And so Todd Bolsinger starts off his book by asking this question, and it's a profound question because most of our churches, almost all of our churches were started during Christendom. And he asked the question, if Western societies have become post-Christian mission fields, how can traditional churches then become missionary churches? And he calls his book Canoeing the Mountains because, and I don't know if you've heard this, I'd never heard this before. Did you know that when Lewis and Clark, when the Louisiana Purchase happened, Lewis and Clark, they all took canoes. They rode the river as they were going to explore the West. And everything was going great until all of a sudden they came upon something that made them realize their mission had failed. Do you know what their mission, what they came upon? The Rocky Mountains. And they all had canoes. And they realized their mission was based on one giant but faulty premise that would ruin everything. They assumed, we assume, that what is behind us is going to be like what is ahead of us. We assume that what is ahead of us from 2020 on is going to be like what we grew up with. That what is ahead of us is like what is behind us. You know, it's true. The search committee and the elders hired me. But really, every one of you gets to pick your preacher. So here's your chance today to interview me. It is no secret that our fellowship is in steep decline. You've heard the numbers. Every month, over 2,000 people leave Churches of Christ and nine churches close. That is very clear data. That is not subjective. And we used to think that we were declining at the rate of other fellowships. That's not the case. We are declining at four to five times the rate of other fellowships. We are currently at 1.4 million people globally, and our median age is over 50, which means by the year 2050, by the time that I am 69 years old, Churches of Christ optimistically, globally, entirely will be less than 250,000 people. But that's not just data to me. It's not just data to you, is it? That's our friends. That's our kids. That's our grandkids. A few months ago, I went to Pepperdine to prepare for this event that they do every May. And I was hanging out with the other preachers. And this one preacher, a guy who graduated Harding with me, a guy named Kyle, he's a preacher in California now. And he said, just offhandedly, he said, you know, if it's true what happens in California, Churches of Christ happens 10 years later in the rest of the world, then I would like to say, God be with you in 2030. Y'all know this. You've heard this. It happened in Fort Worth 20 years ago. The next generation just grateful for being raised in our fellowship but was no longer willing to participate. It happened 15 years ago in Abilene, in Nashville, all over the place, and now it's happening here as well. Let me show you what I'm talking about. How many of y'all graduated from a Church of Christ college or married someone who did? Show of hands. I'm going to need audience participation. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I would say a large portion of us. 
that's kind of the trend of what happens in Churches of Christ. You'd go to one of our sister colleges, you'd move somewhere, you'd settle down, and you'd find a church that you could connect with. It's almost what all, all my peers did when they graduated Harding. How many of you know a Christian now who graduated from one of those schools but no longer attend a Church of Christ? You don't have to show your hands because everybody does. We as a fellowship and as a church can no longer depend on the pipeline of Christian universities to fill our pews. We've got to start thinking like missionaries. And the way a missionary thinks is how do you relate the gospel of King Jesus to the culture that you're in? So I've heard people say whenever we talk about these kind of seasons and transitions in church, oh, you're just trying to accommodate culture. Listen, the only thing that conservative Christians and progressive Christians disagree on is what year to accommodate accommodate culture too. Y'all know this, right? You want to know the verse that authorizes having a worship team? It's right after the verse that authorizes having a single person up here singing. Peter, y'all know this, Peter, James, and John, they didn't do this number. I grew up thinking they did. That Peter, James, and John did this number. No, the reason we do church the way we do it now is because godly leaders in the 1930s decided this was a good and simple way of doing it. And it was, and it is a good way, but it was developed in the world of Christendom where it was assumed everyone was going to church, and that is not the world we live in anymore. That's not the world you live in. It's not the world your kids or grandkids live in. And if you grew up in our fellowship, it's really hard to see this. It's really hard to see. There's all these dog whistles that we have. There's all these things that, that to us, let me, let me just show you one of them. What song number is Our God, He is Alive? Let's all say this together. What song number is God, he, Our God, He is Alive? If you're a guest, we didn't practice that. We haven't even sang that song in the past couple of weeks. We don't even use the song books anymore. And everybody in here knows that's the number, right? Because we grew up, we have all these kind of ways, and it's great, it's kind of our culture, and I, I don't, I'm not embarrassed of that. I just don't want what we know, those kind of things, to become barriers to people on the outside. So, like, uh, a few years ago, there was this youth uh, group, you know, Pioneer Drive, Church of Christ, or something like that. They were driving down I-30, and there was this Church of Christ family. They were on I-30, and they were trying to um, wave at them, and they thought they were creepy because they were just waving this a bunch of teens. They were just waving at a bunch of teens, and then they, the other people, uh, the other Church of Christ family realized we look like creeps, so they wrote down on a piece of paper something, and then they stuck it up, and the whole van started cheering and waving back. You want to know what it is they wrote? Acts 2.38, and immediately... Everybody in the, yeah, you're one of us. We, we, we have those kind of things. My problem isn't that we have those kind of things. My problem is when we have those kind of things and use them as barriers. If, how many of y'all have ever been to a Catholic church for a funeral? Yeah, and, and, and there's moments where all of a sudden everybody's kneeling and you are not. And you, you feel, you're, you're made to feel like you're an outsider. So that's one of the reasons we're talking about doing this. This is not about one group of people getting their way and another not. This is about thinking like a missionary and making sure that everything we do on Sunday morning is accessible and understandable. So the first order of change is saying what will never change. So I want you to hear this loud and clear. This church will never stop being a Bible-believing, Jesus-following, God-honoring church. We are trying to make communion a bigger deal than ever before. Before. I hope you see that. Communion is where we participate. We get the medicine of immortality. We get to participate in the life of Jesus. We think this is one of the great strengths we can pass on to the next generation. And that's why those numbers that I mentioned earlier ought to give you a sense of urgency. We want to make baptism a bigger deal than ever before. So much of a big deal that we start baptizing lots of people. We think that baptism is where you meet Jesus. It's where you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's where you come out of the waters as a new creation, participating in the story of the Exodus on, where God has been delivering people from sin. We're, we think it's such a big deal. We're putting together a vision that's going to stretch us to work, to, to partner with the Holy Spirit, to baptize hundreds of people in the next 10 years. The eldership wants to remain a cappella, but they want to do it accessibly for people who didn't go to Harding and don't know the Devo songs that they're singing right now or don't know what 728 be. We don't want to lose those things, but we want to erase as many barriers as possible because we say our mantra is we want to be like the early Christians. 
And then we look for the New Testament for how to do one hour on a Sunday morning. But if you're reading the New Testament, well, you know that's not what the New Testament's trying to describe. That's not how the New Testament reads. There is only a couple of passages where Paul addresses churches on how they should do church. And we will follow those passages. But so much of what we do isn't addressed in those letters. So what does it mean to be like the early Christians? I think it means to be like they, they, they lived. You could not read the book of Acts and think, you know what priority for these people was comfort? Their comfort zones or safety? I mean, to be like the early Christians is to fulfill the marching orders of King Jesus, and his North Star was our great commission. We talk a lot about Paul. We don't talk like Paul. Because what Paul is doing when he's trying to plant these churches, shipwrecks and snake bites and all the things that are happening, what Paul is trying to do is, is plant these churches that are in service to the mission of King Jesus. And that led him, by the way, to be incredibly flexible on things that did not matter, that weren't mission critical. Okay, so one of the parts where Paul actually talks about how, to, how uh, the Corinth church, the Corinthian church was a dumpster fire, um, how they were doing things wrong, one of the main parts where people get like how to do church on Sunday mornings is 1 Corinthians 10 through 14. Go back and read that this week. But before he gets to that section, there's no chapter breaks in the original letter he's writing. Look at what he says in Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Though I'm free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the, the law. To the weak, I became weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all people, by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings." Paul, before he gets in a look, you're doing church wrong, says this is the spirit behind it. We're trying to be as accessible, to reach as many people as possible. And this, for the early Christians, led them to do some hard things. But look at why they did that. Right in the heart of Acts, look at what they say. When the Jews are compromising so that the Gentiles could come to salvation, James, Jesus' brother, says, Look, it's my judgment. We should not make it difficult for Gentiles or the outsiders to turn to God. So they got rid of 609 rules. They were extremely evangelistic and open-hearted. They got rid of the barriers that came between them and the gospel. That's what we want to do here. Look, what comes next does not have to look like the churches that I've worked at in the past, but I can promise you, PV, the center does not hold. The famine is coming. And those 2,000-plus people that are leaving our fellowship every month and those nine churches that close, those are not data. That's our family. Let me do it like this. I'm not very good at math, but I think this is right. In three to five years, everybody let's be standing. In three to five years, this will be PV. There will be no second service. In seven to eight years, if you guys in the balcony could go ahead and close. Bal yeah, go and sit down. Uh, and this row, you guys all the way here. Go ahead and sit down. That's 10 years. Let's say these two. That's 15. 20 right here. 25 years. And uh, let's go back four rows. Y'all sit down. This is 2000. Yeah. <laughs> here we are in 2050 if we're lucky. This is what we're talking about. Go ahead and have a seat. And those nine churches that close, for me, that's not data. That's this. That's a courthouse now. The church that mattered the most to me. I hope its impact still lives on. But it's no longer here. So here's the question I'd like to ask. In light of what you know, are you willing to sacrifice now for a better future then? 
That was ultimately the question Joseph asked the Egyptians. And can you imagine being Pharaoh? (laughs) Can you imagine pitching this to the people? I can because I feel like I'm kind of doing it right now. Can you imagine Pharaoh having to go to these people and say, look, I know you've got a full refrigerator. I know that groceries are cheap. I know that everything looks like it's going great. But guys, you are going on a diet. Can you imagine having that task? You know what's interesting? God doesn't tell them the solution. God just tells them the problem. He doesn't tell them what to do. They have to decide in light of what they know now, what are we going to do about the coming future? So that's the question. Fifteen years ago, a little-known startup company, Netflix, went to this giant mega corporation named Blockbuster, and they said, we would like you to buy us out. And Blockbuster said, we're doing quite fine. (laughs) We're Blockbuster. A lot of people these days are frustrated at the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, but I'm not. Let me tell you why. Because the Arkansas Democrat Democrat Gazette has a future because they know their mission is delivering the news, not delivering newspapers. See, when you baptize yourself, when you baptize any form, you're marrying the spirit of the age, right? Right? What I mean by baptizing a form is, is we, you know, we get everything right and we make sure that we, we spend more time talking about who or what we, or how we worship than why and who we're worshiping. When, when you do that, listen, progressive Christianity and conservative Christianity is a thing of Christendom. It is a luxury you will not have in 10 years. And that's what I mean when I say the only thing progressives and conservative Christians disagree on is what year to accommodate culture. Because what we're doing, the conversations that I'm hearing, it sounds like we're saying, yeah, that looks like some mountains, but if we just paddle harder, we'll get up them. That's what we're talking about. What's ahead of us is not like what's behind us. Also, there's water in this thing. So, (laughs) when you baptize your form, when any church does that, she's marrying herself to the spirit of an age and eventually will become a widow. I've tried to lay out the problem as compellingly as possible because I want you to know it really is coming. I think for some of us, it seems like we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. And if that's the case, I, I, maybe I'm too new to trust. I get that. Call some friends or family that go to churches in other parts of the country. Ask them, how's it going? How's it going there? Are, is your numbers increasing? And if they are, is it because of some church split down the road? How, are you seeing churches flourish in your area of the world? And then ask yourself this very, very important question and sit with God before this question. Are we comfortable serving what we want knowing it might mean the next generation will starve? You know, it's interesting. This whole thing with Joseph started off with a dream. I have a dream too. And they involve what we can do together. I have a dream that Pleasant Valley will become a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, Bible-believing, Jesus-centered, grace-based restoration church in central Arkansas that's really reaching people who don't know Jesus. I have a dream, church, that we will be a church that doesn't play the Church of Christ wars that have plagued this state for a hundred years where preachers and members go and talk bad about other churches just so they can get sheep from one sheep pen to the other and then call it kingdom work. I have a dream. We will become a church that really does promote the gospel. There is only one church in Little Rock. I have a dream, church, that we will become a church that is reaching people who are far from God, that we will become known in our city as a church that is a a place for people in recovery from addiction, where families are restored and marriages are saved. I have a dream, church, that that we will send missionaries all over the world, including our own neighborhoods, workplaces, and schools. I have a dream, church, that we will disciple our kids in maturity in Jesus and Jesus only. I have a dream that we will not have some kind of, yeah. You want to know why our unity is so bad here? 
our unity is bad in our, our fellowship because we've preached a Jesus and gospel. I have a dream that we will be a church that preaches a Jesus only gospel, not a Jesus and gospel. I'll, I'll fellowship if you believe Jesus and what I believe about these disputable matters. I'll fellowship you if you believe in Jesus and there shouldn't be Bible classes, there shouldn't be kitchens in the, in the, I'll fellowship if you believe in Jesus and my opinion on what Paul said in these particular things that are hard to discern. That's a false gospel. It builds the very kind of false unity that we have. I have a dream, church. We will become the kind of church we are in the assembly that we are in the potluck. I have a dream that we will be a church that helps heal the divide, that has, the racial divide that has plagued the city of Little Rock for decades, that our small groups, our leadership, our assemblies will be filled with the same kind of diversity that populates heaven right now. I have a dream, church, that we will not be so relentlessly bent on being known for what we are against, but we will be known for what we are advancing, the kingdom of God. I have a dream, church. We don't have to pick between being a church of under 40 or over 40, that we can be a church where we are all equally disappointed together <laughs> because we're trying to worship God multi-generationally King Jesus. This is only possible by the grace of God, but listen, church. It is possible. And you know what? Sometimes dreams come true. I know adjustment is hard, but is anything in life worth doing easy? So, in the end of that story in Genesis, people came from all over the world to get grain. Ultimately, it saved the whole world. And ultimately, Joseph himself saw even what happened to him that was bad, God used for good. Look at this in Genesis chapter 45. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt, in case you were getting gray on which brother I was. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land and for the next five years there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. I don't know why I'm here in central Arkansas. I don't know how to make sense of it except for this story. I think God is doing something in central Arkansas. I think Aslan is on the move and I don't know what that means but I know there are mountains ahead of us and we have been called by God to climb them. 